Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the weekly conversation with the Bridge Conference Ministers for the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. I am Don Remick, and I am delighted that you are here and delighted with the panelists we have with us this morning. Let me share with you a lyric that comes from a song that you may well know, and if you do know it, it will date you. From Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, you who are on the road must have a code that you can live by. And so become yourself, because the past is just a goodbye. Teach your children well. Their parents' hell will slowly go by. And feed them on your dreams, because the one they picks, the one you'll know by. As part of our opening, we want to share with you a story. And I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn to share that story with us. Something happened in our town. A child's story about racial injustice. Written by Marianne Solano, Marietta Collins, and Anne Hazard. Illustrated by Jennifer Zivoin. Narrated by Janelle Conway. Something bad happened in our town. The news was on the TV, the radio, and the internet. The grown-ups didn't think the kids knew about it. But the kids in Ms. Garcia's class heard some older kids talking about it, and they had questions. After school, Emma asked her mother, Why did the police shoot that man? It was a mistake, said her mother. I feel sad for the man and his family. Yes, the police thought he had a gun, said her father. It wasn't a mistake, said her sister Liz. The cops shot him because he was black. Emma was confused. He's brown, not black, she said. Some black people have dark brown skin and some have light brown skin, Emma's father explained. Black usually means African American. Most of their ancestors were brought here from Africa as slaves. I know what a slave is, said Emma. That's when you have to do whatever the other person says. Yes, slaves had to do whatever white people told them to do. Even after slavery ended, white people didn't let black people live where they wanted, go to school with white people, or vote. Who are white people? White people came here from places in Europe or Russia or other countries. We are white even though our skin is light tan. Did our family do those bad things a long time ago? asked Emma. Yes, answered her mother. Back then, many white people thought that they were better than black people, even though it wasn't true. Liz added, Some white people still think most black men and boys are dangerous, even though they're not. Was the man that got shot dangerous? asked Emma. No, her mother said. Shooting him was a mistake. It was a mistake that's part of a pattern. Like the pattern on my blanket? Emma asked. Yes, but this pattern is being nice to white people and mean to black people. It's an unfair pattern. Suppose you had a birthday party and invited everyone in your class except the black kids, her mother said. How would the black kids feel? They would be sad, Emma said. Or mad. And you would be missing out because you never know who is going to be your best friend, said Liz. And you can help others to be fair, said her mother. Like telling Anna to stop teasing Ling about her name, asked Emma. Her mother gave her a hug. Yes, just like that. In another house, Josh asked his mother, Can police go to jail? Yes, said his mother. Why do you ask? That white policeman who shot the black man, said Josh, will he go to jail? What he did was wrong, said his mother. But he won't go to jail, said his father. Why not? asked Josh. 
cops stick up for each other, said Josh's brother, Malcolm, and they don't like black men. Josh was confused. Why not? Some police are black. You're right, said his mother. Uncle James is a police officer, and so is my friend, Kenya. There are many cops, black and white, who make good choices, said his father. But we can't always count on them to do what's right. Malcolm added, I could get stopped by the police just because I'm black, even if I don't do anything wrong. That's not fair, Josh said. What if it was a white man in the car? Would the police have shot him? They probably wouldn't have even stopped the car, said his father. Sometimes white people are treated better than black people, said his mother. But it's not right. Everybody should be treated fairly. Josh's mother gave him a hug. We're proud of who we are. Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela were strong and brave black leaders. They showed us that we can stand up for our rights and set good examples for others. They were treated unfairly, but helped others learn to be more fair. Some people haven't learned yet, said his father angrily. Why are you mad? asked Josh. I'm mad that we're still treated poorly sometimes, but I can use my anger to make things better, said his father. Black people have a lot of power if we work together to make changes. I have power, Josh said, and I'm smart. His father smiled. You're right. His mother added, and you can change people's hearts by sticking up for someone who is not treated fairly. Like how Malcolm sticks up for me when the kids tease me about my glasses? Josh asked. He tells them to step off. Just like that, his parents said. The next day, a new kid joined Emma and Josh's class. His name was Omad, and he was from a country far away. Omad didn't know where to sit or what to do, because it was his first day in school. He talked a little bit, but it was hard to understand him. He said he was learning English. After lunch, the class went outside to play soccer. Daniel and Sophia picked kids to be on their teams. All of the kids were picked to be on a team except Omad. Daniel said Omad probably didn't know how to play because he was new. Sophia said Omad might not be good at soccer. Josh remembered what his mother said about sticking up for people who are treated unfairly. Emma remembered what her mother said about unfair patterns and birthday parties. All of a sudden, Omad wasn't alone. Emma and Josh were leading him to their team. We have enough kids on our team, Daniel said. We don't need him. But Josh was ready. Step off, he said. He's playing. Yeah, said Emma. We don't want to miss out. And just like that, Emma and Josh gained a new friend and started a better pattern in their school. So welcome to our weekly webinar. Um, before we get started with our guests, I have a few announcements to make. As many of you know, tomorrow is June 19th, a holiday long celebrated in American, African American communities called Juneteenth. It's a day to commemorate the last groups of enslaved Americans learning of their freedom from slavery on June 19th, 1865, two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and six months after the passage of the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery throughout the United States. And we have a lot going on tomorrow. At noon tomorrow, the National United Church of Christ will be hosting a webinar recognizing Juneteenth entitled, And Still We Rise. You can register for it at the ucc.org website. Also tomorrow at one o'clock, my colleague Kent Salati will be hosting a webinar where you can learn more about our conference's longstanding uh, Haiti partnership which uh, comes from the Historic Rhode Island Conference. You can register for that at sneucc.org by clicking the events tab. 
And then at 8 p.m. tomorrow, the Peacedale Congregational Church in South Kingston, Rhode Island, will be leading an effort here in our <clears throat> conference of ringing church bells to, com to commemorate the injustice felt by so many who have been killed by police or other vi vigilante outlaws. The folks at Peacedale are inviting churches from all over the conference to ring your bells at 8 p.m. every nine seconds for nine minutes, nine for nine. Then on Saturday, June 20th, the Poor People's Campaign will host a digital March on Washington to make national call for a moral revival. Consider adding your presence to this campaign at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. on Saturday, and then again at 6 p.m. on Sunday. To register, go to poorpeoplescampaign.org. If you'd like to watch a video about it beforehand, you can go to june2020.org. The Reverend William Barber will be there, so you know it's gonna be good. Uh, and then next week uh, on our regular Bridge Conference Ministers webinar, we'll have as our guests four young people who put together our first, who were among those who put together our first online youth revival. Our guests will be four of our own young people, Angelina Toledo, Amanda Simpson, Danny Page, and Chance Dixon. So don't miss that next week at this time. And then if you registered for our November 2019 annual meeting, when Valerie Carr was our keynote speaker, then part of your registration paid for a book, this book. So they are here. So watch your mail for yours uh, will be showing up in your mailbox in the next few days. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kent. Thank you, Marilyn. It's just like church announcements, isn't it? Um, as we go through the various things that are happening within the life of the conference, and we certainly are trying to provide um, meaningful conversations um, with partners along the way. And we are so pleased today to be engaged in this conversation on how to raise anti-racist children. We have two guests that we're going to be speaking with, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce them. Our first panelist is Dr. Piper Kendrick Williams, who is the chair and associate professor in the Department of African American Studies and jointly appointed in the Department of English at the College of New Jersey. She's the author, co-author, I should say, of the Toni Morrison Book Club. She also co-edited Representing Seg Segregation Toward an Aesthetics of Living Jim Crow. She is hard at work all the time, I bet, but currently working on Black Roots, Black Voices, and Emancipatory Practices in African-American Literature and Culture, which is a book-length study which explores the through line that connects slavery to mass incarceration and the attending forms of segregation and police violence. So Piper, we are so glad you are here with us today. And our other guest, well known in the Southern New England Conference, is our own staff person, Debbie Kirk. Debbie is um, the Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministries and has been very active in helping us carry out our commitment to being an anti-racist and work conference and working for racial justice. So Debbie and Piper, welcome today. We're glad you're here. I'm gonna start out with a question for Piper, um, can you just really basically tell us about your work at the College of New Jersey? What is it that you do all day? Well, thank you for having me and I appreciate the invite. Uh, I'm an associate professor and I teach uh, African-American literature in many different classes. So I normally teach African-American literature uh, to 1920 so we start with Phyllis Wheatley, who was a poet in the 1770s, and we go right until before the Harlem Renaissance. And then I'll teach African American literature 1920 to 1980, which lets me get the Harlem Renaissance, the 1970s Black arts movement together. So we look at Black power and arts together, the Black women writers of that period, so Toni Morrison and Alice Walker. Um, and I'm always thinking I'm creating African American lit from 1980. Um, but I will teach more contemporary African-American lit in different forms. So this past spring, I had a capstone on a new interest of mine in Afrofuturism. And uh, that was for my African-American studies majors. 
and we looked at contemporary, um, some contemporary slave, the neo-slave tradition. So Toni Morrison has Beloved, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates just came out with The Water Dancer, um, Colson Whitehead had the Underground Railroad a few years ago. Um, and so that's what I teach. And um, I also mentor students. I was part of a mentorship program for uh, first generation college students who were coming from Essex County, New Jersey. So that's mostly Newark and the surrounding areas. Um, I mentored them for two years. Wonderfully, they graduated this spring. Uh, but of course, we had to be on the Zoom meeting. Um, but really what I feel like I'm doing mostly is I'm in the classroom and I'm encountering students who have maybe never read a book by a black author. If they had, they've read A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry, but somehow when they were taught it in high school, no one mentioned race, <laughs> which I can't even imagine, but so much is unimaginable. <laughs> um, and some of them knew Langs they know Langston Hughes poetry. Um, for some of them, I'm their first black teacher. For more, for more of them, I'm their first black female teacher. Um, New Jersey is very segregated. I don't know if you know that. Um, it's a very demographically diverse place. So there's a lot of different kinds of people in New Jersey, but they're very segregated. So some of my students come from towns that are, like someone told me, one of my students told me she was from a town 98% white. Now I often use humor because I'm talking about things that are hard to talk about. So I was like, how do you know that? Do they have a parade? <laughs> like, do they have placards? We're 98% white, you know? Um, of course, it's probably not even ever mentioned. <laughs> that gets to a question later on. Um, and then some of my students have come from these, you know, cities in New Jersey that are black and brown. So for some students, the College of New Jersey is the most diverse place they've ever been. And for other students, it's the whitest place they've ever been. And it, that telegraphs the segregation because how could, to think about how that could be true from where you come. It is designated a primarily white institute. So it is mostly white students. So Piper, um, we're here to talk about um, how we raise our children. Um, and I know that we have an awful lot of people, white people in our conference and in the United States who, who are well-meaning, parents who believe they are doing the right thing by raising colorblind children. Can you tell us what you think about that? Um, well, my first answer is what I think I know, which is colorblind is racist. And the reason it's racist is because to say, oh, everyone's the same, and to say, oh, I don't see color, um, or any of those other forms is to deny the systematic racism. So black people have a totally different experience. I mean, I, I got an email from a former student who told me that she's 28 years old now, but she remembers being in my class. I used to teach multicultural literature a lot. She was in my multicultural literature class for the English department. And I talked about how I have to talk to my sons about walking around in their hoodies and with their hands in their pockets. And right away, I know what year that is, because that's definitely, that's Trayvon Martin with the Skittles and the iced tea. And I can just keep updating that story. And she said that always stuck with her because it's, she, kn she knows. Her parents never had to tell her sibling, her brother that. So it is very, um, you know, so I think what people, colorblind is like not racist. People can say, I'm not racist. But if you go back in history, a lot of the people who were racist, that was their claim. We don't have the Confederate flag. It's not racist. Segregation. We're not racist. We just think the races like to be separated. So not racist has that um, denial, which is the heartbeat. And I'm paraphrasing Ibram X. Kendi. The heartbeat of racism is denial. So that's why anti-racism has to be how you parent. Because... What if I, this is like not a privilege I have, if I raise my children and only talk to them about how they were equal to the other people, which I do tell them, but fail to mention how in the world people are not going to see them that way, some people, and how dangerous it is if someone doesn't see them that way. So I can't teach, I can't 
parent my child colorblind. And so I thought about um, something I heard because I was like doing a lot of research for this. I think I was getting overexcited and I was researching all these things. So I Googled colorblind and teaching for tolerance came up. It's a great website and they have a lot of good. So one of the things they said was, you never hear a person of color saying, I don't see color. Mm -hmm. So anti-racism demands we speak in the same language. Like in that story, those parents don't even, the white parents talk about it being a mistake, the black parents say it's wrong. Now they both do a good job getting to the underlying message of what, how you should be in the world. But it was striking to me how the conversation in one family had certain language attached to it and the conversation in the other family. So I think white parents have to be anti-racist. One, understanding that black people are fully human. Two, believing, naming, and doing something about racism. Piper, you're on that conversation. Let me ask a bit more about that. What is it that white parents can do to raise anti-racist children? Well, I think there's a lot of different resources. Um, one thing, be compassionate with yourself. It took 400 years of white supremacist design to make racism so endemic, so central to America, and to almost make it invisible so that you can have people who are unconsciously racist or unconsciously biased. They don't even know that they telegraph. Uh, they don't even know they're doing microaggressions. They have no self-conscious that what they're doing is some form of white supremacy. Um, definitely reading a book like this one. What I love about this book is that both parent and child are present in the book. So parent and child could be reading the book together. I think if a parent, a white parent doesn't know and tells her, their, tells her child that they have, they're, they're on a kind of journey. Um, but definitely. Um, Learn about how black people have suffered, but don't pity black people. And I think Christians can understand this because Jesus suffered, but what Jesus called the people to do was not pity him, but to act, to act in the world, to act on the inequalities. I just visited my son's fifth grade class for reading and I read I don't know if you know, I brought my own little show and tell. I don't know if you know the Who Was series, but I read Who Was Harriet Tubman and Who Was Michelle Obama? Because I think uh, most Americans have been miseducated. And so black presence, black contributions have been denied us. So we don't think, we think some people will even talk in the language of a white person's country. This country has never been white. This country has always been a diverse country. So definitely, I mean, it's hard work. I remember feeling completely demoralized when Hidden Figures came out. The movie about the women who worked in the space program. Because I'm a very educated person on black history. I'm a very educated person on black contributions. How come I didn't know that? And then how is white supremacy working so hard for us to not know these things? So there are so many uh, books, movies. I mean, Ibram X. Kendi even has an anti-racism center. Teaching to tolerance has personal development. So I think the parent might have to, if the parent hasn't been really educated in, in anti-racism. Now I know in the UCC, you have really good education on white privilege. So they might have had that, that might give them a, a leg up on this journey. Um, and then when I tell my students, I'm always teaching them for, I always want their second thought. I think as humans, we've already been programmed to think in all these uh, ways of difference and place. So even when I reflect on my own privilege as a cisgendered person, Sometimes I'll think in that homophobic way because it's endemic in the culture. 
But then right away, I think, why am I thinking that? So give yourself room to have the second thought and to not know what to say. I was just in a meeting with a colleague and I wondered why none of my colleagues were opening any of the meetings talking about what's happening or having a moment or something to acknowledge it. And he said, well, I'm white and I haven't been trained and I don't know how to talk. And I think that's really the, un the color blindness has made it so we don't, if we talk about race, we're being racist somehow. So anti-racism, talk, you talk. You talk about it, you name it, and then action. So if you are traveling with your kids around the world and you go across the sidewalk because a black man's walking, you can tell your kids all you want about being anti-racist, but you're telegraphing them fear for black men. If you were in Connecticut, I grew up in an all white town in Connecticut, or if you're in New England, there's lots of all white, everything's in New England, and your, your children never see any people of color, you know, this is not the time to go run out and try to like adopt a black best friend. Black people are very, are feeling very secure in their ability to tell white people to step off, <laughs> like in the book. <laughs> You know, but there are like, my parents, we lived in South Korea, my parents had us go to church at a black church in New Haven. So bring your family into more integrated spaces because I think what's got, one danger of this time is to see black people only in their suffering. Mm -hmm. So Amani Perry wrote this article. She's a professor at Princeton called for the Atlantic. It just came out. Racism is what is it? Like racism is wrong, but blackness is not. Mm. You know, so black people, you know, so I think that in this moment right now, it's really the work of white people to dismantle these systems. Thank you so much, Piper. Um, I, I loved your telling of the not knowing what to say, right? Um, wanting to be comfortable, um, wanting to not make a mistake and and allowing systemic racism to hold on right to to allow you the privilege of not even talking about what's going on that's a that's a really helpful reminder um we're thinking about the work and and racism is white people's work and we're thinking about that work related to parents um before they have the conversation with their child. You know, we always talk about the talk. <laughs> I think there's now another talk that has to be, um, and, and particularly for white parents, this is the talk about what racism is. How would you um, imagine, or what is the work that white parents have to do in order to have the talk with their children about racism? Well, definitely they have to, re-educate themselves. So this is an education process and there's definitely resources to know all about black history. But I think you could start with the black, so I think you can talk, start. Do you know that your friends, parents have to have a talk with their black son? And do you know what that talks about? Well, you know, Cole's parents have to talk to him about what it's gonna mean when he's 16 and he looks like a man and he's driving. You can actually Google the talk and see a whole montage of people talking about the talk. Why doesn't a white parent start there? What does it mean in there? Because I think the privilege is always two sides. So if you don't have to do it, you have privilege in it. So how do you name it? You, you see what is some of the things that black people experience and you can really make it local. What's going on in your town? What's going on in your school? So I think there's some way that it could be really cool if parents and children could be in it together almost. I think kids always see their parents as authority and maybe if white parents can be humble in their journey and it can be a team effort. Cause you can even see how in the story that started, it was the kids who brought the conversation into the house. And then the parents had to step, you know, step up for it. And it was good. I felt like in that white family, they really did talk about a lot of things. They talked about slavery. They talked about segregation. They talked about Jim Crow. 
You know, the younger boy said, some people still think that. A lot of my students like to think they're in New Jersey. And I'm like, don't go with it happened a long time ago or it happened down there. You know, stuff happens down this campus. So I think in some ways, you know, talk about the experiences of Black people. So, um, you know, we've been talking about um, what white parents should do. Did she freeze? She did. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the question, unless she comes back midstream and I'll step out of the way. Um, so as, as Marilyn was talking about, we've been talking about white parents, white children. We want to have an opportunity for you to talk about what is it that black parents can do um, to advocate for their children's educations education in the school system? What are, how, how can black parents be advocates? Well, I think black parents can be advocates by being involved in the systems that are at school. So joining the PTO, um, making sure that you come into the classroom, like when you can volunteer and to bring diverse things into the schools. Um, I know definitely more generally as a black parent, um, and I got this from my mom, you know, the first time I was called the N-word, I went home and my mother told me, you are not that word. But you are. And she filled in for me this like vast network of family history of strong black women that I was like inheriting and that I was a part of. So I think what's so crazy about this moment is like black parents still have to do the work of building up their children in a way that's almost like a black power. Their children have to feel strong. And I, have, and I always tell my students, like, I have to build my children up so when they get called the N-word or someone wants to touch their hair, they're ready for it. But then simultaneously, white parents have to be dismantling. So it is a kind of tricky thing where white people might feel like, how come black people get to keep being black and we have to like sort of dismantle being white? Well, a lot of this is unfair. And if, I think at this moment, you could be a little overburdened. Um, but... In my district, we've started something called the Multicultural Parents Association. And we really started in a moment of crisis when there was a terrible racist event at the high school and parent, that, that child's parents were looking around for help. And some of us stepped up to decide to become this parent slash like advocate group. Um, and so we work, we have meetings monthly and we work on diversity in the district. Now, luckily, we have a good superintendent, and she started an equitable practices program. And she's looking at, and this is what you need in your district if you don't have it. Look at how talented and gifted classes get formed. So one thing that we change in our district is instead of it just being the teacher who recommends the students, because the teachers probably have the inherent bias that we all have. Uh, so now parents can recommend, special teachers can recommend. So a Someone besides the another teacher could recommend a student. Um, we looked at how we do discipline. There's a lot of writing on how there's uh, disparities in discipline in schools. Um, I think for black parents, it's like you have to make sure that you are building strong people and that as much as you can, you play a part in their education and you demand so my MPA is trying to figure out what we're going to do with the superintendent's equitable practices group. And now we want to ask for deliverables because everyone likes to study, 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 and they never get to action. So I think that um, you have to play your part. And I think if you don't have the means or the, because not everyone is built to be, you know, out in front fighting the fights. So try to link up with the groups that are doing the work and try to link up with the people who um, are working on it. But it is a practice. So I know when um, my oldest son was called the N-word the first time, we could have this conversation. We talked about James Baldwin. You know, we talked about how something's wrong with that kid because we're not that word and they have to work on that word. And I liked that by the time it happened, we could already have this like intellectual conversation about it because we'd already been talking about it. So for black people, you have to talk about it. You have to talk about it. You have to talk about it. 
And then you talk about how we're beautiful and we talk about how we're strong. And, you know, we talk about our flaws. I mean, one thing that was so heartbreaking for me today was seeing Richard Brooks talk because they have him on tape because he did a re-entry program and he mm -hmm. talked right at this point. He just wants the people in charge to see his life. It's like Black Lives Matters, it's like can become an abstract. <laughs> but my black life matters and my mother's black life matters and my children's black life matters. And every one of us is an individual person with an individual life. And we wanna be, be seen in our full humanity. That's why I think some of the readings are all about the extraordinary black people. Well, what about the regular black people? Mm -hmm. Don't they deserve not to be shot by the police? Don't they deserve to have enough food to eat? So it is a ongoing thing. And I think, you know, white people just have to start sharing in this. They have to be in their schools thinking this is wrong. If they see that everyone in their school in honors is white, they have to name it. You know, you remind me, Piper, of something you told me that at some kind of an event, your multicultural parents association had a little table where people could join and all the white people. Now it's multicultural, meaning white people can be jo joined it as well, right? Oh, we, we debated a lot and, about the name. And <laughs> right? No one stopped. And that's well, we just had a big event on Saturday at our local park that we sponsored with one of our town commissioners uh, where we had faith leaders come and speak. Um, we even had the police chief come and speak. We had a kid talk about how when he moved into the town, his mother told him he can't jog around because you can't be a black man running. Someone's going to think you're running from something. Um, a few of the a 16 year old stood up and talked about how we need to get a bill through Pennsylvania so that the police conduct is transparent because now it's private. And so it was well attended. It was diverse. There were like 300 people there. And I almost wanted to cry because these are the people who have just ignored me and my group all these years. And then on Facebook, everyone was like, good event, good event, good event. And then I couldn't help it. It was like the same day. I was like, I, were, I have been disheartened and bewildered sitting at the table with the MPA sign and white people just walking by like, that has nothing to do with me. So I hope when we get back to the new normal, all the people who are joining up are ready to act. Thank you so much, Piper. Marilyn, did you have another question? I saw you leaning in. Nope. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Piper, for thank you um, for having bringing, me. bringing your wisdom, experience, um, all the all the study that you've done um, really helps us in our in this conversation. So thank you so much for that. I want to turn <laughs> to Debbie, um, and Debbie's going to share her screen and um, sort of amplifying what Piper was talking about was, which is one part of the work, right, is education. It's not everything. Education is not everything, but it is a part of the work is to do the work of knowing stories, knowing, um, educating ourselves about racism and systemic racism and how to be anti-racist. So Debbie, what are some of the resources that we can share that are available to folks on our website to help their to help parents of the conference, um, right? Sure. Expose their children to a more inclusive understanding of our history. So Debbie. Yeah, sure. Um, so my colleagues and I have been working on this. Uh, Dr. Dominique McIntosh, who's our Minister for Racial Justice, has, has been um, you know, curating a lot of materials and also on the discipleship team, uh, Karen Zeal and Debbie Glyne Allen and Kristen Putney and I are collecting things that we hope are useful. And um, just to show you, I hope you can see the screen now. But uh, if you go to our homepage, sneucc.org, and click up here on this purple banner, you can get at our racial justice resources. Um, the other way is to go to the justice homepage here. But I'm going to go through this just to show you what's available. This is a picture of Dr. McIntosh. 
Um, and again, uh, there are a lot of things here. I think um, first for pastors, uh, there are many uh, blog posts that look at recent events through the lens of faith. And so those are very valuable uh, in terms of interpreting uh, what's going on in current events. Um, there are, as, as we said, there are lots of uh, materials for families. So um, here's a whole tab that opens up uh, materials for families. And there are some things um, on this page. And uh, as Piper said, um, you know, um, parents really have a key role in this instruction and um, helping children to understand that they are uh, beloved of God, that they are created in God's image, and that if um, one person is, is suffering, that we all suffer as people of faith. So um, there are ways through these, um, through these resources, books and videos, that parents can open the conversation, that parents can uh, gain skills and tools for, um, you know, identifying the teachable moments and, uh, and responding. And um, I think there are a lot of things here, um, both books, videos, um, similar to the ones that you saw at the beginning of the show. Um, another area that you can find, um, if you look here, is uh, resources for faith formation leaders or youth leaders. Um, you know, part of what we are trying to do is to help young people uh, identify themselves as, um, as leaders in justice and to give them cultural competencies to uh, respond to uh, issues. So there are uh, materials for youth leaders and for faith formation leaders to bring in, um, you know, lessons of God's extravagant welcome to teach about what is open and affirming and accessible to all and what is multi multicultural and multiracial. So, um, so those things are there. Um, some of the events that were mentioned um, show up in the related, related events panel here on the left-hand side. So tomorrow, the Juneteenth, and still we rise. And, and so if you're looking through our website, you can see events that are related to uh, anti-racism work here. And um, I think uh, the other thing I was gonna just point to, um, is resources for local churches. So if you want to begin some of the discussion or continue the discussion and dialogue in your local church, uh, uh, Dr. Kendricks mentioned um, the white privilege curriculum that's here, or this welcoming diversity is a way for a church to assess where they are. Uh, those are things that are available. And um, and then you can look through and see there are also uh, webinars that you can attend here through uh, a partner organization, PRC. Um, I guess I would just close with a couple of ideas for, for next steps. Uh, some of these events that are, are listed here are uh, ways for you to continue your own um, growth and education. Uh, we do have racial justice workshops that are on the books for the fall. So those are opportunities for, uh, for folks to continue their education. And um, then we do have um, two newsletters that might be of interest, uh, both the Ever Flowing Streams and the Discipleship Matters newsletters that will give you posts about events that are coming up or more materials. So I hope that's helpful for folks, and you can reach out to us if you want to follow up on any of those. Debbie, thank you for sharing the resources and offering yourself as a, a check-in for those resources. And Piper, thank you for your stories, your witness that helped to open our eyes. I'm going to take you back to that verse that we started with, teach your children well. Their parents' hell will slowly go by and feed them on your dreams, the one they pick, the one you'll know by. You join with me to close in prayer. God, it is not simply a matter of teaching the children, but it is also a matter of learning ourselves, the stories that we have not heard and need to hear, that our hearts and minds might be opened, that we might teach our children and learn from them. 
that we might hear all those voices around us and within those voices hear what you need us to hear and understand what you need us to understand. That your realm of love and justice may find a home in our hearts, in our churches, our community, and our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go in peace to be a people of action. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.